All right, so, uh, so today I will talk about two topics. One is the inference on conditional moment inequalities, and the other is on subvector inference uh, based on moment inequality models. So the first half is uh, inference based on conditional moment inequalities. Um, so on Monday, uh, on Tuesday, <laughs> For you guys, uh, I talked about uh, the unconditional moment inequalities, um, but many of the models that come up are in fact conditional moment inequalities, uh, where you have a conditioning variable or random vector. Uh, this is a vector of exogenous variables, um, and the moment inequalities hold conditionally on this vector of exogenous variables, okay? So these might be the exogenous uh, control variables or exogenous characteristics of uh, products and markets in the entry game case. Um, in any case, so that can lead to these conditional moment inequality restrictions. Um, these conditional moment inequality restrictions is a little bit more complicated because the conditioning um, means that these moment restrictions imply an infinite number of moment restrictions. Right? It means that the inequality holds for all values of x. If the support set of x is a finite set, that is okay because that's still a finite number of moment inequalities. You could use uh, the previous, previously discussed methods to do inference. But if the support set of x is infinite, uh, then you have an infinite number of inequalities to deal with. We know if the model is a standard equality point identified model, um, the infinite number of restriction doesn't cause too much of a trouble because you can take just a few of them, uh, enough number of them, a finite number of them that will lead to the same identification. If you take the you know, the optimal Chamberlain type instruments, you can even do some parametric efficient uh, inference with a, a finite, a subset of all the inequalities. But in a model with a partial identification of the parameter, um, it's possible that all the restrictions implied by the values of X matter. Uh, and it's very difficult to reduce these inequalities to a finite number of moment inequalities without losing identification, without losing more identification, right? You already not, do not have point identification. Losing identification means uh, your identified set is bigger, okay? So, so under partial identification, it's desirable to try to make use of all the inequalities that you have. And there are two basic approaches in the literature. One approach is, um, uh, is an instrumental function approach. And that's, that approach first transform the conditional moment inequalities into an infinite number of unconditional moment inequalities and equalities using an instrumental function or a collection of instrumental functions. These instrumental functions, um, I will talk about that these in instrumental functions a little later, but there will be some requirements on the collection of instrumental functions. And that's one way to deal with the conditional moment inequalities. Basically that's to turn them into unconditional moment inequalities using instrumental functions. <clears throat> Um, and the second way is basically to non-parametrically estimate the conditional mean, and then test these non test um, the hypothesis that the conditional restrictions hold uh, using these non-parametric estimates of the conditional mean. So I will talk about the. Okay. 
Hold. You got locked out. Oh. I mean, let me check. All right. Right. So I was <laughs> I was talking about the collection of instrumental functions G. Um, I was saying that G should not take non-negative values uh, because we wanted the equivalence between the conditional moments. And and the unconditional moments. We wanted the equivalence between these two sets. Uh, that's if one set holds, the other set should also hold, the set of restrictions should also hold. Um, we, this equivalent is gonna require something, some, th some um, put some requirement on the G, first G should not take non-negative, uh, should take non-negative values. So if G takes non-negative values, then clearly the conditional inequalities and equalities will imply the unconditional. And also G should contain functions with uh, small supports um, because otherwise the local violations to the inequality cannot be picked up. So if G has only functions that are of global support, uh, then if the conditional moments inequalities, especially the inequalities are violated on a small interval, uh, then the unconditional moment inequality will not be violated. Uh, that means uh, these two sets of restrictions will not be equivalent, right? So if G, take only non-negative values and also contain functions with small support, um, we, we can show that uh, these two sets of conditions are equivalent. And also we cannot make D the collection of all non-negative functions because that collection is simply too big. It's very intractable. If it's too big, then it's hard to analyze the asymptotic property of the estimate of, of the estimator of the um, population expectation of M times G, right? So it, so now um, in Andrews and Xi, they show that uh, the collection of indicator functions for all hypercubes or hyperboxes on the space of X, uh, denoted by script G sub box satisfy all three requirements. So this G box is going to make the unconditional moment restrictions and the conditional moment restrictions equivalent. And it's also not too big. It's also satisfy a uh, manageability condition that will allow us to show uh, uniform weak convergence of the estimate of the population mean, okay? Um, 
And the result in Andrews and she um, does not depend on the continuity of the conditional moment function. So it doesn't have to be con continuous in X. Uh, so that um, is, a, is a general result that can apply in a lot of problems, right? Without continuity requirements. Um, they also show that not only the collection of indicator functions of all of all hypercubes works. Um, in fact, you don't need that many. You only need a countable subcollection, G sub C cube, uh, that is also sufficient. That can also uh, make sure the guarantee the equivalence between the conditional moment restrictions and the unconditional moment restrictions. Um, and this, what is this countable subcollection? Uh, sub that is simply a collection of indicator functions of hypercubes of this form, right? This is a hypercube in the DX dimensional space. So that's, um, that's a Kronecker product from L from one to DX. And on each dimension, the edge is AL minus one over two R to AL over two R, where AL is a number that takes value one, two, three, da 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 to two R, right? So, and L is a index for the dimension of X and R is, um, um, R is a integer value that starts with a positive number, positive integer and it goes to infinity. So what is this doing? So this countable hypercube, let's say X is one dimensional. If X is one dimensional and X lies down the interval zero to one. Uh, I forgot to mention that before you apply these uh, hypercubes instrumental functions, you normalize X to zero one. So X is normalized to the zero one to the power d x, right? So you can you can always do that by simply applying a CDF function on x. So so turn it into a zero to one number, and let's say x is a one dimensional, from zero to one. Then the countable hypercube is simply, you know, suppose you start with r zero equals one, then it's going to include indicator function. So indicator function of this interval. So that's G1 and this interval, that's G2. And you not only include the partition of this level, but also you uh, partition it um, further, say partition it into four intervals and that's G4, uh, G3 and that's G4 and that's G5 and that's G6. And you just keep going and cut it, cut the interval finer and finer. And so it's G7, G8, G9, and so on and so forth, right? So keep if you keep going, you can see that this collection, countable collection of hypercubes um, do um, contain indicator functions of intervals that are very small, right, in lens. So, in this way, you will be able to capture violations on a very small uh, subinterval of the X variable. Right? So, you, so that's the idea of the instrumental variables. And this collection of hypercubes is um, also a collection that is quite manageable. It's uh, the Vapnik um, VC class, Vapnik Severonic. Uh, class of functions that uh, um, this property of, so this class of functions has a property that will allow uh, the empirical process indexed by it um, to have a weak convergence result. So that's um, what this approach uses to come up with limiting distributions for the test statistic. So what, it, what are the test statistics? The test statistic, the test statistic is going to summarize uh, the violations to the moment inequality and equalities in finite sample. So you can 
So for each G, each instrumental, instrumental function, there are a finite number of moment inequalities and equalities, just like in the unconditional moment inequality case. So you can estimate the sample mean of the moment function and the sample variance covariance of the moment function. There are finite, so this is a finite dimensional, fixed dimensional, doesn't change with the sample size. You can plug that into the S function that we discussed uh, um, two days ago. Um, so that is, so that measures how much violation there is for instrumental function G. And then you need to aggregate up with respect to the instrumental function G over the whole collection of instrumental functions. One way to aggregate is, the, is by taking an integral uh, with respect to some weight, some probability measure. And that's the kramer wrong misses type statistic. So just taking the interval uh, I believe this term comes from testing the equality of two CDFs, right? The one, one statistic is based on the maximum of the difference of the CDF and the other is based on an average of the um, difference of the two CDFs, right? So, and the idea here is the same kramer von misses is taking an average and kolmogorov smirnov statistic is taking a maximum. And just to remind everyone, so this S function, uh, there can be different forms. Usually there are these three. One is uh, the max time. It takes the maximum violation to every moment restriction. Uh, so for the equalities, the violation to the moment restriction is basically a non-zero number. If it's non-zero, then it's a violation to the moment restri restriction. And for the inequality restriction, we take the negative part because only the negative values of the moment function is a violation to the moment restriction. So the max statistic, max S function takes the maximum of uh, for over each uh, moment function. And the sum um, or method of moment um, S function takes the sum over all the moment restrictions. And QLR uh, takes the inverse variance weighted distance of the sample moment to the null space, right? The space restricted by the null hypothesis. So this lambda um, is, um, is basically T that is composed of zeros. The first P element is zero and the next uh, P element, P, uh, K minus P element. So let's say this is T bar. T bar is greater than or equal to zero. So that is the um, set of population mean that is allowed by the null hypothesis. So, so, so these are the test statistics. And in order to come up with the right critical value, well, before that, I also want to talk about a little bit of uh, a subtle difference between the conditional moment inequality test with the unconditional moment inequality test. So here in the conditional moment inequality test, the variance covariance matrix that we put in here is not the uh, simple sample analog variance covariance matrix, uh, but it's that sample analog variance covariance matrix plus a regularization term that makes sure that the whole thing is still invertible or at least their diagonal elements are invertible okay um this regular regularization term has a tuning parameter epsilon and epsilon in anderson chi that is a fixed positive number And an epsilon is multiplied by the diagonal of sigma and theta one k. So that's the variance covariance matrix using uh, one as the instrumental function, right? So, um, so 
with this regular uh, regularization, sigma and bar can be invertible, or at least its diagonals can be invertible, then the S functions can be calculated. Um, and not only the S function can be calculated, but also we can show the uniform convergence of the inverse of the S function, uniform over G. So, um, but of course there is a cost of doing this regularization because when G is small, uh, the because of this uh, epsilon regular, regularization, the very small Gs will uh, have little impact on the value of the test statistic. And that means if the violation um, to the moment inequalities happens on a tiny little interval, then that might not be picked up by the test in a given sample size. But if the sample size is bigger, uh, that can still be picked up. So the test is still consistent, but the power might be affected by this epsilon. But on the other hand, it, Adding this epsilon also allow us to have a smaller critical values. It's not clear whether um, whether the power or effect is always in one direction or the other. So now let's take the Kramer von Mises type test statistic as an example and uh, talk about how we do asymptotic approximation for the distribution, for the null distribution of the statistic. Um, well, the idea is the same as the unconditional case. What we do is just uh, subtract the population mean from the sample mean of the moment function, and then add the population mean back. So we can just write this term as the sum of these two terms, uh, one term is the demeaned sample mean multiplied by square root n. And that is a empirical process, right? That is an empirical process indexed by G. Um, and this part is just square root n times the population mean. The empirical process here, um, we can show if the G function belongs to a collection that we specified, the countable hypercube or the hyperbox collection, then we can show this empirical process weakly converges or converges, converges in distribution uniformly uh, to this Gaussian process, this tight Gaussian process with continuous sample paths. And that, that Gaussian process has a variance covariance matrix sigma theta g g prime, which is the covariance between m w theta g x and m w theta some other g x. Um, and that is Estimable, you can consist consistently estimate this covariance um, covariance process, right? So you can estimate this covariance process, um, and using it to simulate an approximation for this empirical process, right? So you can simulate from this Gaussian process to approximate this part. And the sigma n bar is something that um, converges to a non uh, non-random limit, and that can be esti estimated by sigma n bar. So that part also doesn't affect our ability to approximate the limiting distribution of this statistic. Uh, but this part, again, like in the unconditional case, that is a part that cannot be estimated consistently, uh, let alone uniformly consistently in G, uh, because that is a population mean multiplied by square root n. Um, well, fortunately, you can use the same idea as before. Either you can replace this by zero, which then will give you an upper bound for the null distribution of uh, the Kramer von Mises statistic. Um, but that might be conservative because you, 
because these uh, slackness parameters could be really far from zero. If we re replacing it by zero might be making the bound too high. Uh, but you can also do generalize the moment selection. Uh, you can use the sample version of this population mean to do a selection just like here. When the sample moment um, is when the standardized sample moment multiplied by square root n is less than or equal to a threshold, then we cannot be sure that this moment condition is slack. So we replace, we use zero to replace that root n e um, times g. And if this standardized sample moment is bigger than kappa n, then we are sure that this is a slack inequality, we can replace it by a large number. So in the unconditional case, we're using positive infinity here, but in the, inf in the conditional case, uh, we are not using a, a an infinity, but instead using a sequence that <coughs> goes to infinity, uh, goes to, to infinity slower than kappa n. So if kappa n is uh, say log n, this could be log log n. So um, the reason is simply because in the unconditional case, we were able to show that this there is no integral here, there is no g either. So it's all finite dimensional things. We, are, we were able to show that um, this function um, has a limiting distribution, right? Um, but with the Gs, now G has, G belongs to an infinite collection. Um, in Andrews and Xi, we were not able to show that this converges in distribution to um, a well-defined limit. Instead, we were using an approximation, uh, an asymptotic approximation to this. And because in order to, make the asymptotic approximation argument work, we have to restrict the GMS um, generalized moment selection function uh, to not be positive infinity, but instead some number that is bounded by k about n. So, um, so yeah, so once you, um, once you estimate the sigma and replace the population expectation times root n by the GMS function and use the sigma n here in the variance covariance matrix, uh, in the position of the variance covariance matrix here, you can simulate the Gaussian process and get a simulated conditional quantile of this statistic. And that's the asymptotic normality based uh, critical value. And of course, you can also do bootstrap. Um, bootstrap is different from the asymptotic approximation only in here, instead of using Gaussian process to approximate this, you use um, the bootstrap version to approximate this part uh, and use the bootstrap version of the variance covariance matrix as well. So, so these are the critical values. Uh, there is, if you read the paper, you. You see, there is also a little bit something weird here in the definition of the critical value. Uh, so, the critical Shasha, value, yes. Sorry, which page are you on? I'm looking at page nine. Are you on page nine too? Oh, so this is not working again. No, I'm not on page nine. <laughs> it doesn't... So I'm on page 11 now. Yep. I am, are you on page 11 now? Yes. Okay, so yeah, that's current. Mm, okay. Critical value, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. So you can have a look at page 10. Are we on page 10 now? Okay, so that's page 10 I was showing. There is not much information. I was just showing that you could use bootstrap process, empirical process in place of the Gaussian approximation and the bootstrap variance covariance matrix as well. All right, so now we are moving to page 11. Hopefully it's the same for everyone. Okay, so, so um, the critical values, uh, there are 
I talked about two versions of the critical value. Um, the two versions are easy to understand, but there is something weird in the definition of the critical value, uh, which is this little eta that you add here. So normally when you take a critical value, you just take a one minus alpha quantile from an approximate distribution, uh, approximation of the null distribution of the test statistic. Uh, but here we're taking the one minus alpha plus eta quantile. So we kind of allow a little bit of uh, leeway when we take the quantiles. And not only that, we are also going to add a little small number eta to the quantile. Okay, just make sure that we're not too small. Um, the reason that we need these uh, weird modification is as follows. One reason is that we, uh, in that paper, we did not derive limiting distribution for the test statistic. So there is no limiting distribution um, because, there, because we didn't, Get the uniform convergence of the square root n times the population moment in G. Uh, the asymptotic argument is based on a sequence of approximating distributions. And because there is no limiting distribution, it's a bit hard to argue that the limiting distribution is uh, strictly increasing and continuous. And this strict monotonicity and continuity is useful for showing that their quantiles approximate the quantile of the null uh, distribution of the test statistic. We don't have that. And we also don't have results on uniform concentration and uniform anti-concentration of the uh, null distribution of the test statistic. And that's the reason that we are not able to show that a quantile is consistent uh, but if you just allow a little bit of uh, enlargement, uh, it's going to be big enough. And so we think that, you know, the need for this is probably just due to our limitation in deriving the theory, because in practice, whenever we set eta to zero, the result is still pretty good. And the, the test has good size property. Uh, so it, setting eta to zero in the Monte Carlo doesn't seem to be a problem. All right, so a little bit of uh, Monte Carlo e exercise for this. Uh, in this Monte Carlo example, we consider a, um, um, a missing data example where we have a dependent variable y, explanatory variable x or instrumental variable x, and there is also a selection variable t. Y is only observed when t equals one. And we clearly we do not assume random uh, selection. Suppose that the parameter of interest is the conditional median of y at some given value of x. Okay. Uh, median, say median income of people with schooling level uh, 12, something like that. And we make the assumption that um, there is a monotone median IV, which just says that the conditional median of Y given X is non-decreasing in X, right? Conditional median of income is non-decreasing in schooling, which is kind of credible in this context. And using this monotone median IV assumption, we can set up these conditional um, moment inequalities uh, about theta, right? So, so this indicator y less than or equal to theta, t equals one. So that is the event that y is less than or equal to this theta is the candidate for the median. Um, here tau is uh, 0.5. So, so, so we know because tau is 0.5 and theta is the candidate for a median, y less than or equal to theta minus tau given x. 
uh, equals little x zero, that should be um, zero, right? So that is the moment restriction that we start with, but y is not observed. So this indicator is not always observed. It's only observed, this event is only observed when t equals one. So when t is not equal to one, we just set it to one, right? We just set the indicator to one. So we just make the value bigger and we obtain a inequality, right? And, and when we set, um, the when we set the value of y to be above theta for t equals to zero, we obtain this uh, lower bound, right? This this inequality of the other direction. So whenever we set this indicator to one, we obtain this uh, this greater than or equal to inequality. When we set the indicator to zero, we get the less than or equal to zero inequality. And and we use the monotone median assumption here um, because, because, we say, because the median is not increasing, we can say that if this equals zero, then given x equals x for some other x, these would be, if x is bigger than x zero, then this would be, um, less than or equal to zero if x is bigger than little x zero, because when x is bigger, y is also big. The probability that y is less than or equal to theta is small. And this is greater than or equal to zero when x is less than or equal to x zero. So using all of this, we can derive these conditional moment inequalities, right? Um, and these conditional moment inequalities, uh, we can draw the conditional mean of the conditional moment inequalities. Sorry, so this is the moment function. We can view, so these are two moment inequalities, right? But we can also view this as the moment function when x is less than or equal to x zero, and this as the moment function when x is greater than x zero. So we can draw the conditional mean of the moment function as one curve on this graph. And the conditional mean of this moment function can be drawn in this way. We consider three specifications. In one specification, the conditional mean function looked like this. Um, this curve satisfies the null. Um, So under the null, this curve should be greater than or equal to zero. And this curve now satisfies the null. And there is a large set of X values at which the inequalities are binding. And this curve also satisfies the null, but there's only one point of X at which the inequality is binding. And this curve also satisfies the null and there's only one point of X at which the inequality is binding. Uh, but the difference between these two is that um, the kink here is kind of flat, but the kink here is much sharper. And we are, we are going to investigate the size and power property of the tests with different specifications of the test under these three scenarios. One is a flat curve, flat conditional mean. One is a kinked conditional mean, it's kind of flat. And the other, and the third one is very um, pointed at the boundary. So this is the result. Um, in the flat bound case, we should expect the Kramer Vaughan and Mrs. type to work better because the Kramer Vaughan Mrs. averages up every uh, moment restriction. Um, so it uses kind of utilizes all the moment restrictions better. And in the flat bound case, um, when the moments conditions are violated, they're violated kind of at the same time. So many of the moment conditions are violated. So you, we do want to average them up instead of just taking the maximum of the violation. So in the flat bound case, we should expect uh, there to be not too much under rejection under the null and we should expect the power to be higher. 
for the Kramer von Mises type of statistic. And in the, in the peaked bound case, uh, the Kramer von Mises might not work all that well because it averages everything up and it doesn't. So the, the little violation at the peaked point doesn't stand out as much as in the uh, Komogorov Smirnov type of statistic. Right. And, and the following is what we found. Um, <clears throat> so in the flat bound case, we find at least if you are doing GMS, generalized moment selection, the test has very good size. Um, and in the peaked bound case, the test and the rejects, right, has um, the so this is what's reported is the coverage probability of, uh, of the confidence interval. So, so it over covers the true value in the peak to bound case. And the, what's reported here is the false coverage probability, which is better when it's smaller, right? The smaller, the better, because this, this the, is the false coverage probability. In the flat bound case, the Kramer von Mises does better, um, has the smallest false coverage, and the Komogorov and Smirnov has higher coverage. And in the peaked case, the comparison is reversed. So the Kramer von Mises is, has a higher false coverage, and the Komogorov and Smirnov has a lower coverage, right? So we do see that these results are consistent with our um, intuition. But in all cases, the GMS does better than the PA, which, we, which uh, use zero instead of the generalized moment selection function. Uh, that's also expected because zero is too conservative an upper bound for the null distribution. Um, and we also calculate the subsampling, critical value subsampling are kind of fine in terms of coverage. It over covers in a lot of cases, um, but it doesn't seem to be very good in terms of power. Um, it's, very, it's very good in this case, but not very good say in the flat bound case, even though we are using Kramer von Mises type of statistic. It's, really hard to explain why it has this behavior for subsampling. So I'll not just not try to explain that. So that's the first approach. And the second approach is the non-parametric conditional mean approach. Um, the representative paper is this uh, Turner joke of Lee and Rosen paper. Uh, for simplicity, let's just consider only one conditional moment inequality. So they can deal with multiple conditional moment inequalities as well, but let's say there is only one. So M is scalar valued. Now, uh, fixing the value of theta, you just want to test these conditional inequalities, conditional moment inequalities. Um, because they want to estimate the conditional mean, let's use a succinct notation for the conditional mean, use beta X for this conditional mean. Right, we're gonna ignore the parameter because the parameter value is fixed anyway. So beta x is the conditional mean of the moment function. Under the null, beta x should be non-negative. So the null hypothesis is that the beta value is always non-negative. So they estimate um, beta x with a non-parametric conditional mean estimator. There are many such estimators, like traditional estimators, including series and kernel estimators. And we can, for any of these estimator, we can also estimate the conditional deviation, condition, sorry, the standard deviation of the estimator at the point X. And that standard deviation estimator is SN. Or you could say this is the standard error, right? This is the standard error for the non-parametric estimator. And then you, they consider the test statistic that is uh, beta n hat divided by the standard error. 
and we take the infimum over all x. Um, we want the test statistic to be large positive under the alternative. So we put a negative in front of it because the inf of beta hat over s is probably ne a negative number. We put a negative in front of it. This would typically be a positive number. Um, so to come up with the asymptotic approximation for the null distribution of this statistic, again, we do the same thing as before. We subtract the population counterpart of beta and hat and add the population counterpart back. So that's the population conditional mean. Once you do that, you get this um, demeaned version of the non-parametric estimate, a demeaned and standardized version of the non-parametric estimate. Um, this is not an empirical process that converges to a tight Gaussian process, but they are able to show that this process indexed by X can be approximated by a Gaussian process um, in the sense that the difference between this process and the Gaussian process is um, uniformly little OP1 over log M. Right, so that's their strong approximation results. So this ZN is a Gaussian process, is a sequence of Gaussian process with continuous sample pies, sample pies, a uh, sample path, even though it doesn't uh, converge um, in distribution when n goes to infinity. Um, so that part can be approximated by Gaussian. And this part is kind of interesting. You see under the null, if beta x, beta x under the null, beta x is always um, greater than or equal to zero, right? So that's the null hypothesis. So if beta x equals zero, then that's just zero. But if beta x is positive, um, then this part will be, when it's divided by the standard error, which goes to zero, this part will go to infinity and will not enter the calculation of the infimum. Right? So therefore, um, it can be shown that the Tn under the null, uh, the distribution of Tn under the null can be approximated by the supremum of the Gaussian process, but the supremum is only over the set of X values that are close to the set of um, contact points for the curve with the zero, uh, with zero line, right? So, so the distribution of Tn can be approximate by sub X over this X inset of the Gaussian process. And Xn is the shrinking neighborhood of X0. And X0 is the set of all X at which the moment inequality is binding on this, they call the, this the contact set. So, so they can show this distributional result under the null. Uh, so, then that suggests you can estimate the contact set and simulate this Gaussian process to get a critical value. And that is what they do. They estimate the contact set and simulate the Gaussian process to get a critical value. And let that, that quantile be denoted by K. Then the test reject the null hypothesis if Tn is better, bigger than that critical value K. Um, so the estimation of the contact set kind of plays a very similar role as the generalized moment selection function, right? It's trying to select the moments that are uh, close to binding. Under this uh, distributional approximation for beta hat, x in Hat, this estimated contact set is constructed as a confidence set for the actual, actual contact set. Um, and that confidence set is designed to have coverage of 
converging to one so that this constructing this confidence set, the error in constructing this set uh, doesn't affect the overall test rejection. So, so that's uh, this method of constructing the test using non-parametric estimator for the conditional mean and using the standard error to standardize it and then estimate a contact set and get approximation from the, get a critical value from the distributional approximation using the contact set. Um, this test, because of some of the result that they use to show the approximation, distribution approximation for T, um, they kind of require the test statistic to be of the inf or soup type. Um, so as you can see, right, like in the other approach, you can, so this measures the violation to the population moment restriction in finite sample, right? At each X value. Um, intuit intuitively, you could aggregate up these violations by supremum, or you could aggregate them up using integral, uh, but they can only do it using the supremum um, just because some of these appro distribution approximation argument um, do not seem to work for the other test statistics. All right, so some Monte Carlo simulations. Um, so that's the simulation from Anderson Shi, um, but uh, there is a comparison of the different tests. It's the same uh, example that I talked about is the median estimation example. So here there is a comparison between the Kramer-Von misses. The Kramer-Von misses with the max fun S function with GMS seems to be the one that works the best. So this table takes this combination as the test to compare to the uh, non-parametric conditional mean approach. And this is the comparison result. So these are coverage probabilities of the confidence interval. In the flat bound case, um, the Krimovon misses does pretty well in terms of size control. It under rejects or over covers in the other two cases. And the, the conditional mean type of, of approach, it, when the sample size is small, has a little bit of uh, under coverage. And the under coverage disappears when the sample size is much bigger. And it also depends a little bit on how you select the number of series terms when you do the non-parametric estimation. They use cross-validation with a specified maximum number of series terms. Um, and this false coverage probability here, um, the comparison depends a lot on the curve. Right, so when the, so at least in N equals uh, 100, the cream of all misses works a lot better in the flat bound case comparing 40 to 69. And, but it works a lot worse in the very pointed bound case. And in the kind of kinked bound case, pointed but not too pointed case, they are kind of similar. And that's the same for all the sample sizes. Right, so, uh, so these are the two approaches that I discussed in more details. There are some other related problems to conditional moment inequalities. Uh, there is many conditional moment inequalities. It's just, it's just um, you not only have a finite number of moment inequality, but also has a collection of conditional moment inequalities where the index for the collection may be infinite. And these other papers consider testing unstructured many moment inequalities. Um, 
And there are also hypotheses that are like this, like it's a conditional moment inequality, but you're not testing the inequality at all values of Z, but only at one value of Z. Right? So that's another type of related problems. And this problem is also related to testing regression monotonicity, stochastic monotonicity, density ratio ordering, because all those can be written as conditional moment inequality, either conditional moment inequality or just uh, many moment inequalities. Um, and uh, uh, Jia has an excellent paper on testing superior, 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 superior. <laughs> superior <laughs> predictability um, of different predictions. Um, and that's a hypothesis of many moment inequalities in a time series context. Um, that's all for this one. Any questions? So there's a bunch of questions I, uh, in the chat. So it's mainly okay. from me and each of So you can take a look. I can take a look. I need to stop sharing before I can take a look. So I, I can just say my question just to make okay. life a little bit yeah, easier. Sure. So why yeah. is on page five? So okay. if you go to page five, um, so it concerns the choice of sort of boxes. Yeah. So. I'm thinking about this following situation. If some of the box is small in the sense that it contains a relatively small number of observations. Yeah. So the corresponding unconditional moment is going to be estimated relatively noise, you know, sort of noisy estimate. Yeah. Yeah. And so for certain in certain for certain, you know, tested statistic, um that may sort of contaminate the whole, you know, the entire statistic, the noisy. So, so if one component of the moment condition is noisy, it may contaminate the whole thing. Yeah. And hence drag down the power. I mean, then, yeah. I mean, theoretically it's, un, it's very hard to avoid, but in yeah. practice, how to think about, you know, what is a good way to sort of mitigate this issue? just for practitioners. Yeah, so I think we had some uh, very informal guidance in the paper. We, the truth is we don't really know, <laughs> but we had some like intuitive uh, guidance, like um, don't make the smallest the interval too small, like it, it should contain like, 10 or 20 observations, uh, but that's just a intuitive, uh, statement. We don't have a theory behind it. Uh, but if you look at here, we use um, R1 equals 7. I believe that's uh, dividing the sample into 14 equal parts and 250 divided by 14. Each smallest interval would contain 10 to 20 observations. So in that case, it seems to be working just fine. But if you consider a small sample size, I think with, um, although this might be different, this might be using a different R, but the, here you have a smaller sample size. Um, I don't remember whether we changed the R for different sample sizes, but the we, we might. I think the idea is to keep the smallest interval to contain 10 to 20 observations. So the other question from mm. myself is on page eight. So basically it's, it concerns the sort of empirical process theory. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, so the question is whether there's an easy way to verify this for time series. Yeah, so, so it, it looks like it's the box stuff, right? Is it, so it's current number generated empirical process. Yeah. So that is yeah. the sort of thing is for ID data, and whether you know a version of that for time series, that's the question. Yeah, I, I think I found some paper uh, in time series, but I didn't look very carefully into it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I don't have a very good answer for this question. I need to look into it, yeah. Okay, sure. 
So you chong is. Okay. Uh, my question is on page seven. So Xiaoxia, you mentioned uh, the standard covariance matrix estimator may not be invertible, so you have to do the regularization. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm so just wondering. Not invertible. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering why it is not uh, invertible. What's kind of the intuition behind? Oh. Yeah. Mm. So so what I said was not very accurate. What I mean is um. So it's not uniformly invertible over G. So clearly it's not because G is going to be smaller and smaller when you get to the very small boxes. And, and when G is small, this will be, when G goes to zero, <laughs> this sigma also goes to a, a zero, right? So it's not uniformly invertible. And oh, that, yeah. that's why uh, we are not able to show uniform convergence of the inverse of this. I see. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Yeah. So if I may, so I also have a question about uh, the previous lecture, you know, the paper, yeah. your paper with uh, Craig, Greg. Yeah. So the, so I think, so one interesting thing is, so when you do, uh, so you estimate the T, right? So yeah. in the construction of the test set to, to say you get T as a byproduct, and yes. then that determines the, the degree of freedom for the chi-square distribution. Yes. So um, could you explain sort of intuitively how uniformity can still be achieved? So, mm. so to, to help, you know, to sort of construct the answer. So my uh, uh, puzzle, I mean, yeah. so my, my, my puzzle is, uh, so in the situation where there is a positive, you know, strictly positive T in the population, but somehow mm -hmm. that T in final sample is close to zero. I'm just thinking about T being local to zero yes. to be a potential mechanism to make this, you know, argument difficult. So maybe, yeah. I mean, that is, that is my, my puzzling point. Maybe you can just uh, address this. Yeah. Uh, Yes, so the validity of that test is um, is based on a conditioning argument. So it's so we don't have an unconditional approximation for the no distribution of the test statistic, uh, but everything is conditional on which moment is active, which moments are active, which inequalities are active in fine sample. So conditional on the identity of the fine sample active inequalities, um, we show that, so, so we have two parts of the result because the, the first part is a finite sample result. There's no uniformity concern at all. So everything holds exactly in finite sample. Uh, and that's when we assume the moment conditions are normal and the variance covariance matrix are not estimated. So there we have exact finite sample result. Um, and there, the reason that the exact finite sample result holds is because conditional on the identity of the active inequalities, um, the test statistics is going to have a truncated normal or truncated chi-square distribution. And the truncated distribution has the same quantile or smaller quantile as the corresponding chi-square distribution and like untruncated chi-square distribution. So that's why the critical value works exactly in finite sample in those cases. And in asymptotics, uh, we simply show that, so we show that um, this conditioning still works. The kind of a non-standard argument. In finite sample, we, when we do the conditioning arguments, um, the identity of the active inequality um, partition the space for the sample moments into different polyhedral cones. And in the asymptotic argument, we show these polyhedral cones um, just converges 
the polyhedral cone in the finite sample just converges asymptotically. Um, I think the reason is there are only finite number of polyhedral cones and the, and I can't remember the exact argument, but uh, the idea is that the polyhedral cones do converge um, and there is no switching back and forth between the polyhedral cones when you consider a sequence of uh, distributions. So yeah, I don't know whether that's that's a good intuition for why it's uniformly. Yeah, I guess it's useful. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. uh, because the the polyhedrals are discrete in some sense. I mean, it's, it's discrete, discrete. And, so it's yeah. faster. It, the convergence is faster. So maybe that yeah. is the reason why it breaks the the yeah. usual yeah. you know local yeah. to you know zero yeah. kind of argument. So because yeah. it's faster, the then, then there's no problem. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I got yeah. it. Yeah, great. Okay. So do we have more questions? I mean, I think it's a good opportunity to ask questions because uh, otherwise we take a break, then come back in maybe 10 minutes. Is that good? Yeah. 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 OK. So see you in a few. OK, great. Thanks.
You ready? Yep. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, so this last part of the this series is for subvector inference for moment inequality models. Um, the term subvector inference, you know, I never thought it would be misunderstood, but the other day I was asked what it means. Uh, it means inference for a subset of all the parameters. Uh, I think the confusion was whether the subset means a subset of moment inequality or a, sub a subset of something else. Here, the subvector means it's a subset of the parameters in the model, right? We're still using all the moment inequalities. Um, stretching the term a little bit, the subvector inference could also include inference for functions have, of parameters. Do, do you want to share the screen? Ah, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you. It works. It uh, works. Yes. Now you have it. Yes. So yeah, I was on the second page. So subvector inference means uh, doing inference for a subset of all the parameters in the model. Say one of the parameter or another parameter. Uh, stretching the term a little bit, it could also include doing inference for functions of parameters. In fact, the first approach I will talk about is um, doing inference for a function of parameters. Um, so the then this could help with uh, say counterfactual inference because counterfactuals are functions of parameters. So why is this an, an, an issue in the moment inequality context, right? It's not really an issue in traditional or standard GMM or standard maximum likelihood. It is an issue here because, because the parameter is not identified. We are we have been doing inference by test inversion. And the test inversion that we have been talking about only gave us confidence set that are joint confidence set for all the parameters in the model. If you have 20 parameters in the model, the test inversion we have been talking about give you a 20 dimensional joint confidence set for all of them. And if you are only interested in one of the parameters, uh, you may project the 20 dimensional joint confidence set onto that dimension and get a confidence interval for that parameter you are interested in. But that projection is going to be very conservative, right? It's like using a chi square 20 critical value for inference for one parameter, uh, where you should use a chi square one critical value. Um, and that's the theoretical problem of um, doing subvector inference by projection of the joint confidence set. And another problem with that is computational. Computationally, if you're only interested in one of the parameter, you may not want to compute the joint confidence set, which may be really hard to do. Um, just an example for why sometimes you might want to construct just a, confident, a marginal confidence interval for one parameter. So consider this interval outcome IV example from Gandhi, Lu, and Xi. So we talked about this in on the Tuesday's first lecture. Um, in this model, often the moment inequality, the moment inequality model looks like this where you have a dependent variable that is the inverse demand. So this is the upper bound for the inverse demand. This is the lower bound for the inverse demand. These are the dependent variable. And you may have some explanatory variables, including price and some other controls, some other characteristics of the product. And usually the key parameter that, um, that you want to do inference about is the price coefficient. So that measures how 
much the demand is sensitive to the price of the product. So this is the key parameter. In the coefficient on the controls, they could be useful, uh, but they are not always useful. So the controls are included not because they're interesting, but because they are included to make sure that the instruments are valid for, for price. Um, so it's so you so in that context, you would want to focus on this uh, price coefficient and treat delta as the nuisance parameters. In such models, it's not uncommon to include brand fixed effect. So this brand fixed effect will appear as dummy variables in the control variables. And when you include brand fixed effect in such models, delta can easily be 20 to 30 dimensional. So there are, there are many uh, brands of uh, certain products. And projection of such confidence set to one dimension can be very conservative and computation can also be hard. So I always thought this is a developing um, like area, but when I wrote the lecture notes, I found there have been a lot of, pro uh, a lot of methods that have been proposed for this. Um, so these are some of the methods. Uh, one of the, some of the earlier methods include profiling and calibrated projection. Um, and then there is also elimination method. We eliminate the nuisance parameters from the model first and then do inference. And there's also this very clever conditioning test idea that will also take care of the nuisance parameters. Um, so once you condition on certain statistics, your test statistic no longer depend on the nuisance parameters. Uh, and there's also this method that's uh, a bit different than others is the quasi-basing method using um, MCMC approach to simulate a, a posterior uh, credible set for the parameters. And it works for sub-vector inference as well. So I will only talk about the first four uh, because I am not exactly sure where to put this one. So I'll just only talk about the first four approaches. So, um, and in fact, even though these, uh, there have been a lot of papers, almost all of them are proposed for finite number of unconditional moment inequalities. So it's basically finite number of moment restrictions uh, with uh, two exceptions. One exception is this working 2013 version of Gandhi, Liu, and Xi. Uh, we no longer have that part in the current version, but in the working paper 2013 version, we have a, a section that does um, profiling for infinite number of uh, moment inequality. And Bologna, Bugni, and Chenadrukov also has a paper on many moment inequalities um, where they also do a profiling. So, but here we are gonna focus on finite number of unconditional moment inequalities. So finite number of moment inequalities just look like this. Uh, a bunch of inequalities and a bunch of equalities. And here the parameter of interest is not the whole parameter vector theta, but instead is a function of theta. And here lambda is a known function. Typically lambda is of much smaller dimension than theta. So d lambda typically is much smaller than d theta. And so again, uh, lambda is not identified either because theta is not identified. So we, at least at least we're not guaranteed that lambda is identified. So we do the inference on lambda theta by testing version as well. So we test the null hypothesis that lambda theta equals a given value for some theta, satisfying the moment inequalities. So the test statistic that uh, this profiling idea uses is quite intuitive. So we just take the Anderson Suarez test statistic. So that is the same test statistic as the one that appeared in lecture two. Um, that's the, with the S function applied on the sample moments and the sample variance covariance matrix. 
Um, that is the test statistic that you would use if you want to do full vector inference on theta. But now we want to do the subvector inference on lambda. So we profile out, we take the profiled criterion function uh, by taking the infimum of the criterion function over theta in the set such that lambda theta equals our hypothetical value lambda, right? So um, the word profiling comes from the profiled likelihood, right? In profiled likelihood, you first take the maximum of the likelihood with respect to the nuisance parameter you want to profile out, and then you study the property of the likelihood function um, of the profiled out uh, the likelihood function with the nuisance parameter profiled out by taking the supremum over, nuisance, over the nuisance parameter. So here we are doing the same thing. Um, the parameter theta is profiled out when we take the inf. So the inf step is the profiling step. So, so we have this statistic inf of the S function root n sample mean and the sample variance covariance. So we want to derive the limiting distribution or at least a limiting approximation for the distribution under the null. So uh, we do our usual thing. We uh, create a empirical process part, the d mean the sample average, d mean sample average plus a root n times the population mean. We did the same thing in the full vector inference case. And now again, this uh, Gaussian, this empirical process part is fine because under quite general conditions, we can show it converges weakly to a Gaussian process indexed by theta. And sigma is some variance covariance matrix for the Gaussian process, variance covariance process for the Gaussian process that we can estimate. So this part doesn't cause any problem. The problem again is with this root n times the population mean part. It's hard to approximate this or even to bound this in the subvector inference case. Um, so this part, it doesn't convert uniformly. It doesn't allow a consistent estimator. And what's more, previously, under the null hypothesis of the full vector inference, if theta is in the identified set, we know the sign of this term. Previously, we knew the sign of this term. But now we no longer know the sign of this term because for theta in this set, this set may contain points in the identified set for theta. And also it contains theta values that are not in the identified set for theta. Okay, so this is simply the set of theta values that can provide can produce a lambda value that equals this uh, given one. So because not all the thetas here satisfy the moment inequalities, so we do not know the sign of this term anymore. So we cannot just naively replace it by zero as we did in the full vector inference case. We also, um, not, are not guaranteed to, uh, to have a valid procedure if we just replace it by a GMS function, right? Because the GMS function is justified also using kind of the known sign of this uh, term. So that creates a new problem. Um, however, observe that if we define theta i lambda to be the values in theta lambda that is also in the identified set of theta. Then for theta values in this set, uh, we do know the sign of root n e m w theta. The sign of it is it's non-negative. We do know that it, it is non-negative and we know s function is again is non-increasing in this argument. So if we can somehow um, estimate this theta i lambda set and first discard the values of theta that are not in that set, 
then we are only left with theta values in this set on which we know the sign of this and we can bound it by zero or by any of the GMS function. Right? So then this is the idea that produced one of the critical value used in this paper. That's the discarding critical value, uh, which estimates the identified set and then replace this theta lambda by the ad estimated identified set and replace the root and EM part by the GMS. And replacing the whole theta lambda set by the estimate estimated identified set is making this uh, range of the infimum smaller. So therefore that increases um, the value of the statistic. So in that, in that way, it increases the value of stati statistic. By replacing root and EM by the GMS function, that also increases the value of the statistic. So when you do the two things, um, the statistic you get has a distribution that is an upper bound or approximate upper bound for the null distribution of T and lambda. Uh, so that's the way that the discarding critical value works. You can use a Gaussian process or a bootstrap to approximate this new part, this new part here, okay? All right, so that's the discarding critical value. Um, but you see this discarding critical value could be too large because both the discarding and the GMS part increase the value of the statistic, especially the discarding part. Because we know when we take the inf um, in the test statistic here, it's not only the thetas in the identified set that will um, matter for the inf, but also the thetas that are around the identified set, like local to the identified set, that will also matter for the inf. It's like when we take the minimum of the GMM criterion function, it's not only the true value that matters for the minimum, but also a root and neighborhood of the values around the true value that matters for the infimum. And if you get rid of that root and neighborhood and the infimum may be too big, right? Um, in the like GMM case, if you take the minimum, including the square root and neighborhood, you take the minimum over the whole space, then the minimum of the criterion function is going to be chi square, uh, say d, chi, chi square k minus d, like k is the number of moments and d is the number of parameters, right? Distributed under the null, under the null of correct specification. But if you get rid of the neighborhood, only consider the true value. You put the true value in the moments and consider the GMM criterion function. The dis distribution of that is chi square k. K is the number of uh, moment conditions. So not considering the neighborhood around the true, the identified set potentially leads to a much larger critical value than you want. Okay, so in that sense, this discarding critical value is not desirable. It might be enlarging this test statistic too much. Um, so there is a different way to provide an asymptotic upper bound and this is motivated from deriving the limiting distribution of the test statistic. Uh, now let's try to derive a limiting distribution of the test statistic. You remember this test statistic equals inf over theta s of this empirical process plus root n em sigma n theta, right? So this new n theta, as we said, it converges weakly to a Gaussian process. Sigma n had converges uniformly to a variance covariance matrix. This does not convert. However, we can show that um, the set of, we can show that the set of this set Theta combined with root n 
PM. W theta. So this pair, right? This pair um, for all theta in this set. So this is a set, two dimensional set. We can show that this set converges. And this infimum is really, you can write this as infimum over theta L in this set where theta is here but you write L here, right? So this test can be written as inf over theta L in this set, S nu and theta plus L, sigma n hat. This set we can show it converges, it have a well-defined limit and the appropriate subsequences of the data generating process and subsequence of the theta. It has, a well-defined limit and using that convergence, we can show the test statistic converges in distribution to this inf over theta L in the limiting set as nu plus L sigma theta, right? Um, and then we have a limiting distribution for T and theta, and that's going to motivate a different critical value that will take into account the values of theta that are around the identified set. So we observe now um, sigma and nu are not the troublesome part. The troublesome part is in fact, this gamma set um, that is hard to estimate. And we know this gamma set is cluster points for sequences of this form, theta n, root n, e, m, w, theta n, is cluster, collection of cluster points of sequences of this form. Um, and we can show that there is another set that is the cluster point of sequences of this form, and that the cluster point of the sequences of this form, we can show is a subset of gamma. So it's kind of a smaller set as gamma. And sometimes we can show that it's the same as gamma. Sometimes we cannot, we can only show that it's a subset of gamma. Um, the reason is that, you know, so the limit, the, um, so in finite in, each theta corresponds to one value of root n e m w theta. But when you consider a sequence of n, each theta, um, when theta has the same limit, this root n e m w theta may not have the same limit due to the root n. It depends on how fast theta n is converging to a point, right? So each limit point of theta can correspond to multiple values of this. And this multiple value is caused by this root n multiplier. And here in this approximation, we're using a smaller multiplier, kappa n inverse times root n. Kappa n is a slowly diverging sequence. Uh, and because this is a smaller diverging sequence, uh, the way that it can create the multiples of limits for this um, for the same limit of theta n is a subset of the ways that the root n can create, right? So that is the reason that um, the limit of this set could be a subset of gamma. Um, and because it's a subset of gamma, we can um, replace the gamma by this, this set. And then the limit of the cluster point for this set will be a subset, infimum over a subset is a bigger number. So that provides an upper bound for the no distribution of the test statistic. Okay, so, so this critical value is a penalized critical value. We call it PR, so penalized critical value. Here, what we do is to replace root N E M W theta by kappa and inverse root n m and bar, 
right? We don't have E M W theta, that is a population quantity. We will replace it by the sample quantity. And the kappa and inverse here is going to kill the estimation error in M and bar. And kappa and inverse times root and E M bar will give you a limiting gamma set that is a subset of the original gamma set. Okay. And that is roughly how this uh, test statistic works. And this part can be viewed as a penalization term because as, as we said, if we simply replace the whole E root and EM with zero, it's not gonna work because when you replace this by zero, the infimum could be achieved really far away from theta and that infimum could be too small. And the discarding critical value avoids that problem by not allowing the infimum to be taken over the thetas far away from the identified set. Well, this term can be viewed as a penalization term that also do not allow the infimum to be achieved very far away from the identified set. Because for thetas very far away from the identified set, this value is too negative leading to S value that is too big, right? So that's not contributing to the infimum. So in the way this term uh, provides a way to stop theta to wander too far away from the identified set, um, but also it serves another purpose. It also serves the purpose as the generalized the moment selection function. Um, all right, so this is the penalizing critical value. Uh, so we have two critical values now. Um, both are upper bounds, asymptotic upper bound for this infeasible approximation for the test statistic under the null. This is an infeasible approximation because the expectation is infeasible. Um, they share the same conditionally random part. So all these, all these are deterministic. They are not random. They, but the random part is this uh, bootstrap process. The two statistics share the same random part. If you use the same random draw, same bootstrap draws to simulate this part, then they share the same random part. They are, and therefore, if both of them are upper bound, then the minimum of the two also provide a valid upper bound for the infeasible approximation. Um, so we can take the minimum of these two critical value statistics and take quantile from the minimum, okay? Taking the minimum is not messing up the size because they share the same random part. It's only in the non-random part that they are not the same. So the hybrid test take the minimum um, and the critical value is just the one minus alpha quantile of the minimum. Of the minimum, right? that should be the minimum. So, so here is uh, some discussion of the computation aspect. When lambda is much lower dimensional than theta, say when lambda is a scalar, but theta is a 10 dimensional vector, um, then this test inversion set is much smaller dimensional than the joint confidence set for theta. So computing this requires you to test um, much smaller number of points. If lambda is one dimensional, you can just search on an interval, right? You can even use like bijection methods to find the boundary of the interval. And so searching for its boundary could be much easier. Sometimes you could use bijection, uh, which is really quite efficient for finding the boundary of the interval. So computationally, uh, it saves computational costs in this sense. However, um, you see that when you define the profiled critical value statistic, both the discard and the penalized critical value statistic, 
Both of these involve a minimization over theta and you're bootstrapping them. So you're really bootstrapping the minimization. So you, if you bootstrap it 500 times, you need to do these minimizations 500 times. So some people may think that is computationally costly and that could be computationally costly in some cases, um, but it may not be as bad as it sounds because the criterion function is typically smooth. Whenever the moment function is smooth, it is smooth. Um, and also we, if their minimizers over theta is not unique, uh, we don't have to find all the minimizers. Only one minimizer is needed. Um, and that's okay because we just want the minimum value of the criterion function, not the minimizer. We don't have to find the minimizer very accurately. Um, and to find the minimizer, we have a good starting value for it because you, before you com compute the critical value, you have already computed the test statistic, the profiled test statistic, which also is a minimization over theta. Um, and the minimizer you found when you calculate the test statistic is a good starting value, right? You, so you could go crazy and try many starting values for the test statistic that is not very computationally costly because you only minimize that one once, right? It's, it's, like, it's not like you do bootstrap. It, it's not like when you do bootstrap, you repeat the minimization. You only minimize the original sample st test statistic once. So you can be uh, afford to be more precise and find a good starting value, find a good minimizer. And that minimizer can be used in the bootstrap minimizations as starting values. That should uh, speed up um, the computation as well. And lastly, when you do the minimization in the critical value statistic, you don't have to be very perfect. Not finding the global minimum is okay in the sense that that's going to only result in a confidence interval that is a little too big, but not too small. Okay, it's a bit more conservative. Okay, so. For these reasons, the computation of this approach may not be as bad as it looks. Um, so that's some discussion of this. And the, there is this second method, uh, calibrated projection. That's uh, the representative paper of that is Kaido, Malinari, and Stoey. They consider the same moment inequality model um, but they don't write the equality and inequality separately. They write everything as inequality. Um, they focus on a parameter interest of interest that is the linear function of the model parameter theta for a known vector p. And what they want to do is to find a confidence interval, ln to un, uh, that covers the true value with the pre-specified probability. Here, the LN is defined to be the infimum of the parameter of interest subject to the relaxed constraint, right? Subject to the sample version of the relaxed constraint. We're in the relaxed constraint. Um, you take the sample, standardize the sample moments and allow that to be as big as a critical value C theta. And under this relaxed constraint, you calculate the inf and the sup of uh, the parameter of interest. And depending on how much relaxation you give, the interval might be big or small, but you're gonna choose this relaxation according to distributional theory so that the interval has the right coverage, right? So you calibrate these Cs so that this interval has the right coverage. Mm. So how do you come up with the calibrated C? Um, so to come up with uh, the calibrated uh, critical value, 
so you realize that, say, take the upper endpoint as an example. The upper endpoint is bigger than the true value of the parameter of interest if and only if uh, this hold. So basically, you subtract p theta naught. You subtract p theta naught uh, from here. So if p if sup of p prime theta is bigger than p prime theta naught, then sup of p prime theta minus p prime theta naught is going to be greater than or equal to zero. So that part is easy. Um, so this lambda is really just uh, theta minus theta naught times square root n, right? So this inequality is uh, equivalently written as zero less than sup of p prime lambda. Because lambda equals this, lambda is in the space root n theta minus theta naught. But they're also going to put a regularization here. They will not allow lambda to wander too far away from zero. Um, now, the constraint is also going to use this reparameterization. So before they were all in terms of theta, now you write it as theta zero plus lambda over root n. Uh, then to come up with the critical value, the idea is to approximate the distribution of this, of this test statistic, approximate this, the distribution of this, and then you simulate the, the approximated distribution of this. And that simulation will give you the probability of this inequality holding, right? You simulate some values and you do this, you calculate the supremum subject to the constraint with your simulated value for the test for this statistic. And you check whether this is greater than or equal to zero or not. So you basically can simulate T and use that simulation of T to calculate the simulated probability of this being greater than or equal to zero, and you cal calibrate C so that this probability is some given value, okay? So that's the idea. So the, I, so the key is to approximate the distribution of this max statistic. So the key is to approximate this. How do they do it? They do it by linearization. So they linearize, so first, uh, they are going to write root n m bar into root n m bar minus e m. So they create this Gaussian process part first. So that's the Gaussian process part. But then they are also going to have a um, root n e m theta naught plus lambda over root n divided by sigma n j hat theta zero plus lambda over root n, right? So they have a empirical process plus this root n standardized population mean. They will linearize the population mean part around theta zero, just do a Tyler expansion. So dj is going to be the first derivative of this, First derivative times lambda over root n times root n. It's just going to be first derivative times lambda. And then plus root n gamma j. And gamma j is the leading term of the expansion is root n em theta zero. Theta zero is a point in the identified set. Okay, So they do a linearization around a point in the identified set. Um, then they observe that this is a Gaussian process that um, it's asymptotically equivalent to new nj theta zero, because when lambda is in that box, lambda over root n goes to zero. So, and that can be approximated um, very well because we can estimate the variance covariance matrix of that process. And dj is the derivative of the uh, population mean that can be estimated by a sample analog estimator. And this root n gamma j, 
that is root n e m w theta naught. And theta naught is in the identified set. So we know the sign of this. So this is non-negative. And we can use the, the usual GMS function to approximate this part. So everything is in place. You simulate this Gaussian process, estimate the first derivative of the moment, and use GMS to replace this uh, root n gamma j. And, and you're ready to do your simulation and calibration of the critical value, okay? So the critical value is by simulating that T using the simulated probability of the coverage of the interval to calibrate the critical value, okay? Uh, for each given value theta naught in the identified set, for each given theta naught in the identified set, all you do is to simulate the open infs, which are linear, which are linear programming problems. They are not very hard to do. Um, however, once you get the critical value, the critical value depends on theta. You still need to calculate this upper and lower bound to get the interval, right? So for each theta, they do this simulation and calibration to get a critical value. But once you get the critical value, you still need to calculate the bounds, lower and upper bound for the confidence interval. And the procedure for calculating the lower and upper bound is a constrained minimization or constrained maximization problem. And the constraint depends on a simulated critical value, which is not differentiable. So and, and the infant soup is taking over theta, which is not the subvector, which is the whole parameter vector in the model. So if you have a 20 dimensional parameter in the model, then this infant soup are 20 dimensional minimization and maximization subject to these constraints, this nonlinear non-differentiable constraints. So this is not a very easy task, even though C hat theta is easy to compute for each value of theta. Um, in this paper, they have another contribution that is that they offer a image processing um, technique based uh, methods to do this uh, constraint minimization and maximization more efficiently. And in some problems, it seems to work pretty well. Okay, so that's the uh, the calibrated projection method. It's still projection but it's a calibrated critical value to make sure that the coverage for the subvector is the right one, okay? All right, so for the, then there comes the elimination approach uh, by uh, Greg and me. <clears throat> so this um, elimination approach is kind of a limited approach. It doesn't apply to general moment inequality models. Right. It only applied to a specific kind of moment inequality model. And the specific kind of moment inequality model has several features. One feature is that it has, one feature is that the nuisance parameter, the parameter that you are not interested in, enter linearly. So the nuisance parameter needs to enter linearly into the moment conditions. And another feature is that we have a conditional inequality conditioning on some exogenous variables. So in this notation, the B, C, and D matrices, these can depend on, right, can depend on the exogenous variables as well as the parameter of interest, but they cannot depend on uh, may not depend on endogenous variables and the nuisance parameter. And so this is kind of restricted, not only linearity, but also this, uh, this thing, okay? So it's a limited model, but it's still kind of useful in many of the applications.
the Gandhi-Lewin shear application I just showed, um, it does fall into this framework because the deltas are the coefficient of the control variables. They do enter linearly and they're co they are coefficients of the exogenous variables, okay? So the way to do inference on this model is, uh, so we propose a elimination methods. So for this model, the idea is still test inversion, right? So we want to test the null that uh, there exists a delta such that expected value of B M bar theta uh, plus C delta is less than or equal to D holds, right? So there exists a delta such that this hold, or in other words, it's a B times mu plus C delta less than or equal to D, where mu is the population moment, population moment, okay? So the null hypothesis is that there exists a delta such that this hold. And there is a very classical approach, classical uh, result that says that this hypothesis, right? The null hypothesis is that this set is non-empty. This statement is equivalent to these inequality constraints with A mu less than or equal to B. Well, in this inequality constraints, there is no delta. Delta has been eliminated. So there is a classical result that shows that you can eliminate delta from this linear set of inequalities. Um, there is this Fourier-Monsky uh, algorithm that dates back to the 1800s um, that give you just the way an algorithm to get A and B from B, C, and D, okay? That algorithm is not unknown to moment inequality literature, and it has been introduced to the literature to do kind of a subvector inference or specification testing by Guggenberger, Hein, and Kim, but the approach has never been used in practice. We, are, we know of no um, paper that uses this even to do Monte Carlo simulation. Um, we believe part of the reason is that the Fourier masking algorithm for calculating A and B is very difficult. Um, <clears throat> in fact, there are many computational papers that study this algorithm and there is no polynomial time computation um, um, methods to compete to complete this algorithm to finish this calculation right so it's basically um, the computational cost increases exponentially instead of polynomially with uh, the dimension of b and the dimension of the nuisance parameter so that's uh, uh, computationally difficult but uh, for, for if you recall the conditional chi-square test that we covered in lecture two, if you apply the conditional chi-square test on this eliminated moment inequality, we can show that you do not need to calculate A and B. You can test A mu less than or equal to B using the conditional chi-square test without calculating A and B. And that's the idea of that paper. Um, the idea to calculate A and B Calculate the test without A and B is as follows. You can calculate the test statistic very easily because the test statistic for the null A mu less than or equal to B is equivalently, uh, it can be equivalently written as minimum over mu delta subject to the original constraints with delta. Right? Simply because A mu less than or equal to B is equivalent to there exists a delta such that B mu plus C delta less than or equal to D. So calculating the, calculating the test statistic, you really do not need to have A and B, right? So that's okay, but you also need the critical value. The critical value is the chi-square critical value with the degree of freedom 
that is the rank of active inequalities among this set of inequalities. Now, without A and B, how do you know which of the inequalities are active or not? That is kind of tricky. We use some of the convex analysis result to find that this R hat, this rank, can be equivalently written as the dimension of this polyhedral cone. Um, and the polyhedral cone is defined using the original uh, B, C, and D matrices, not the A and B. So then again, you don't have, don't have to compute A and B to get R hat. Um, Computing the dimension of the polyhedral cone has a linear time computational algorithm. So it's much easier to do than the Fourier masking um, algorithm. So that's, uh, so the, a discussion of this. So this method is computationally much easier than either the profiling approach or the calibrated projection approach. Um, but of course it only, applies to a specific type of model with the linearity feature. All right, so that's that approach. And I also want to try to explain the, this very clever conditioning idea by Andrews, Ross, and Pecos. Uh, I don't know how good a job I can do here. Um, <clears throat> so they consider basically the same model as uh, Cox and Xi. So pretty much the same, um, where the nuisance parameter delta also enters linearly. And also there is a conditioning going on here. It's also a conditioning, conditional moment inequalities. The conditional moment inequality here, I, I should mention both for Cox and Xi and for Andrews and Ross and Pecos, this conditioning information is not used fully in their tests. They only use a finite set of moment inequalities implied by this. They consider the conditioning because they do not want C, do not want to consider, take into account the noise in C. They only want to take into account the noise in M bar, right? So, you know, basically the coefficient for delta zero is considered as non random. So that is what the conditioning is for. <clears throat> so uh, what they do is they consider a different test statistic. Uh, this test statistic is uh, this, instead of the QLR, they consider kind of a maximum statistic. Um, they can, so this statistic is uh, the maximum of all the moments of roots n, m and j, theta minus c and j, delta, where the j just stands for the j's row. So this, their test statistic is the maximum statistic, um, but they are not writing it this way. They write it as this linear programming problem. It's a minimum of eta, where minimum is taken over eta and delta, uh, for this, right? So it's, <clears throat> so statistic is, no, not the maximum of this, but also the minimum over eta. So it's a minimum maximum statistic. It's kind of the profiled max statistic. Okay, so that's the statistic they consider, but that statistic can be written as this solution or value uh, for this linear programming problem. <clears throat> And that's useful for deriving their critical value. And we denote sigma. We use sigma to denote the conditional variance covariance of root n m bar. Um, so the constraint, I was writing sigma j on the other side, but, but I can move it to the right-hand side as well. Then the constraint becomes this root n m bar minus c delta less than or equal to eta times the uh, standard error or standard deviation estimator. 
Now let um, y, just to simplify notation, let y stand for root n m bar. And then we move the eta part to the left hand side. You see, there are two parameters, eta and delta here. And the minimization is taken over eta and delta. So we can move it to the other set and write this part as W times eta delta vector. Right? It's just a matrix formation um, of this linear constraint. And W is um, concatenation of sigma hat j and root n c and j, okay? So we just uh, rewrite using different notation, rewrite the test statistic as this linear programming problem. And assume that the solution to the linear programming problem is unique and non-degenerate. That is, there exists d delta plus one element. d delta plus one is the number of uh, elements in this vector, right? It's the number of argument in that minimization problem. Then at the optimal solution, there exists d delta plus one elements um, subset of one to j. This subset is uh, b hat such that y and b minus w and b times eta hat delta hat equals zero. So basically they're saying that at the optimal, there are just exactly the same number of inequality that hold as equality as the number of parameters. So you have a just identified equation where you can solve for eta hat and delta hat, okay? So now you solve for eta hat and delta hat and get uh, this form, W and B inverse times Y. Once you solve it, you see this eta hat is the first element of this. And this is a linear function of the Y and vector. Therefore, eta hat is also a linear function of the y n vector. And the coefficient in the linear function is denoted by gamma and b. We don't have to know exactly what this is. When you compute it, you need to know, but right now we don't know what it is. It is a known vector, okay? So eta is a known vector times y n. And if you plug in this thing into the whole constraint, you find this y n minus w n w n b inverse times y n b is less than or equal to zero. Based on these two things, based on these um, two observations, so eta hat equals a linear function of y, and this inequality hold, they can show that the test statistic, which is eta hat, right? So this is eta hat, is the linear function of y. This eta hat conditional on b hat equals b and conditional on s equals little s um, is gamma hat times y n conditional on gamma hat times y n is in this interval that's completely observed, okay? So gamma hat times y n, when y n is normal, gamma hat y n is also normal. And these are known quantities. So this distribution is really just a truncated normal distribution. So you have a truncated normal distribution here you can simulate a critical value from this truncated normal distribution and use that as the critical value for Tn, okay? Um, and that is their conditional critical value. Once you have the conditional critical value, uh, you can do the test, right? So the conditional critical value is easy to compute. It comes from just the conditional 
just the truncated normal distribution with known truncation points, has no tuning parameter or simulation. However, it has undesirable power property when the truncation points are too large. Um, sometimes it is too large. Uh, so they also propose a least favorable test uh, that is kind of similar in spirit to calibrate projection, but uh, it's not exactly the same. But this least favorable test require uh, a bit more calculation. It requires um, simulated critical values. So they recommend a hybrid of the two. So the hybrid test rejects when one of the two rejects and the nominal size of the two individual tests are adjusted so that the overall rejection is correct. And so they propose this hybrid test that seems to have much better power than each one individually alone. Uh, so some, so these are the four methods for subvector inference that I know something about. Um, I think subvector inference is still a developing uh, area, especially when it comes to conditional moment inequalities and many moment inequalities. Um, not many papers have done that yet. And computation may still be an issue unless you have this linear structure. Many of the papers claim that they have a computationally easy methods, um, but when you read the paper, you see the timer is not always consistent. It's hard to say which one is more credible. Um, so they should be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, on the other hand, computation might not be as big an issue as it seems because we do see a lot of empirical papers, serious empirical papers that apply these methods and got results. <laughs> so there must be a way to do it. Um, there might be a lot of uh, tricks that people could use to do the computation. Uh, just looks more difficult than OLS. Uh, so that's pretty much all I prepared. That's great. So if we have like one or two burning questions, like really burning questions, you know, please raise that. Um, otherwise, it's already pretty late for Xiaoxia. And, you know, we are very You're grateful that. <laughs> I think this is uh, super clear. That's why <laughs> we don't really have questions. It's super, super clear. And, you know, we have this uh, intensive training about this uh, topic, many topics on the frontier of econometrics. And I mean, I certainly has, you know, ben have benefited a lot from these lectures. I believe the audience has also benefited a lot, especially for the you know, PhD students uh, who are searching for topics. And I think this is a gold mine for uh, PhD thesis uh, in the future. So that's, uh, you know, <laughs> thanks Xiaoxia again. I hope we have, you know, in the future we have more opportunities like this to have Xia Xia to you know, teach us about the frontier, the exciting research in the metrics. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, have a good night. Thank you very much.